Thank you so much for having me, everyone. Um, it was a long journey, but I'm happy to, to be here with you guys. My first time in Oregon. And uh, yes, I look forward to talking about the studio and the work. Um, I'll start off by giving a synopsis of what the studio uh, does and what we're interested in. And then I will focus on three main things. That's the molecular, the material, and uh, molecular material and uh, and basically uh, molecular material and matter itself. And then I will show a few projects to give you an overview of how we, how we express these things in our work. And then we'll finish off with questions. So I'll begin. Ubuntu, I am because you are. I am because you are. I am because you are. I am because you are, I am because you are. So this South African proverb is a huge inspiration for me. I feel like it's a, I feel like it connects me to everything. It connects me to the trees, it connects me to the river, it connects me to the land, it connects me to everything that's around me. This philosophy, Ubuntu, I am because you are. I am because you are, I am because you are. So key elements that really inspire Olani Yi's work is, I'm interested in metamorphosis and change. <clears throat> you know, when you have a, a piece of fabric or a piece of clay or stone or, a, or anything that is, is of living matter or even non-living matter, when you leave it out in the environment, there's always change. There's always some form of either erosion, there's a form of decay, there's a form of metamorphosis that happens to matter. And this is a huge inspiration for me. Um, I like mold. I like when things get, get stinky and compost and ferment and all yucky, you know? These things are a huge inspiration for me because there's this system of entropy, this order and this chaos that is happening like right in front of me that, I mean, is extremely fascinating. So in my work, I, I'm really connected to the idea of erosion. I like things that are left to decay, left to grow. And this idea of architectural death is, is really important for me. Um, I have trained as an architect, but my, my work really started off in art, you know? And I, I'm not really interested in any type of skyscrapers, really designing houses, designing you know, buildings, buildings that are, that last more than let's say six months or last more, I'm, I'm interested in, in things that die. I'm interested in, in pavilions and apparatuses and structure that become food for the environment. So allow the environment to, to basically consume it, decay it, uh, compress it, uh, inhabit it. You know, I think these things are, are very, very important for me. Um, I like the, the idea of destruction also, but destruction in the sense of through destruction or through this decay, new life happens. New life uh, uh, comes that you can see. So this idea of bloom, this idea of cracking and, and pulling one way. And so I love this as a collaboration for me uh, with uh, the natural environment. So for me, I think one of the huge things that fascinate me is this idea that an architectural structure can, can be alive. It can dance with the, the wind. It can bleed. Uh, it can bleed with the coldness of winter or it can sweat in the, the hot sun of, of, of the summer. You know, these things really, really uh, connect me to my environment in totally different ways through the work. So, A move away from looking at landscape representations in sculpture and painting and actually using the material in the landscape itself. This, these are notes from, you know, ideas about land art or ideas about actually, actually not, uh, not just seeing or depicting or trying to reinterpret or represent an environment, but actually looking or setting up the parameters for the change to actually happen and give you 
a feedback loop. So this was a transition for me in my art practice. So instead of making representations of the environment and of nature, I started to <clears throat> I started to play with the components of, of a transformation itself and watch, in a way, the, the work itself speak back to me. So it's like a, a, a feedback loop between, between me and my work. So this led me to the ephemeral, ephemerality, constant change, temporality, and things like this really uh, fueled my imagination as I started to make that transition from just representation to actually playing with natural elements in chemistry, I feel like the, these elements of the ephemeral started to speak to me and, and take my work in a totally different direction. So systems, seasons, fragility, temporal time, impermanence. I'm really spending a while on these terms because they're really, really important uh, for me in the work. So here's an example of, um, of what I've been talking about. It's basically the erosion, this, uh, this voice or this presence that comes, that comes on this matter or this material after the wind and the rain have basically had a conversation on its, on its facade. There's a new conversation. There's this uh, apparent change that, that's happening on these materials that I'm super fascinated with. So a few other elements, I think that fascination started to, started to inspire me to look more into philosophy and you know ideas about how uh, humans are connected with nature or how we are nature or we're not nature and all of the other philosophies that, that are out there. Um, yes, I have no, no concrete opinion on that. I feel like I don't know and I don't want to argue either one. I just know I'm inspired by the natural world in general. Uh, I'm also inspired by uh, culture, uh, the way different cultures depict, uh, depict um, nature for themselves in, the, in their cultures or in their cosmological belief systems. So not only, do I, not only am I interested in understanding the environment in different ways for myself, but also how other cultures uh, also depict depict the environment or connect or, um, or the different rituals and ceremonies that are also connected to different environmental systems in their culture. That also fascinates me and, and also inspires the way I, I then reinterpret um, my own belief systems in relation to the environment. The next thing, the internal and the external. Um, I think that a lot of times the, there's a, a spiritual uh, nature to looking inside one's internal environment. And I feel like this also affects the way we act in our external environment. So just as much as the studio's work is interested in ecology, the outward ecology, I'm also interested in my mental ecology and my anthropological view system on the world because that then affects the way I, I talk to a bird or I talk to a tree or I, I you know, dance with a lizard or, or all of these things. My internal environment allows me to do that because I'm constantly tapping in with who I am internally and trying to orchestrate that in, in different ways that is, is also responsible. The same way I would do to the, the same way I would recycle or the same way I would try my hardest to outwardly uh, connect to my disenvironment, I feel like that all starts from looking inwardly. Um, so this is, is also quite important. So I've kind of already touched on, on, these, uh, on these elements here. It's just impact through perception. These are all uh, elements that, that I feel connected to in the work. I've talked quite a bit about uh, adaptation the cultural ele element of embedding like different ceremonial or uh, cultural uh, rituals inside the work that connect to the environment, the idea of dynamism and, and how the world is always pulling and stretching and, and the wind is talking to the rain and the rain is talking to the ocean and the ocean is talking to all of these systems that are constantly in a loop 
uh, is something, that dynamism that is also uh, inspired in the work. And like I spoke about the mental ecology, um, that's the impact through life that my perception is constantly changing through this internal and external environment. And these are, I'm, I'm speaking about these things from a personal standpoint, but from that personal standpoint, this is like, if I'm collaborating with someone on a project, uh, or I'm collaborating in the studio, these are all, let's say, the core beliefs of the collective studio in a way. We're not a huge team, um, but at the same time, we, we share these beliefs, but I think it's responsible for me to, to talk uh, from a personal perspective. Um, and not, not necessarily the collective perspective of Lenny, which I am, no, 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 no. okay. So, um, so yes, as I mentioned, I won't read through, through all of these, but again, uh, I'll, I'll stop here for a second because I feel like one thing that I need to, to, to also make clear is that nature or, or observation in a way, or, or looking at the environment in, a very much so scientific way, but at the same way as a monk in the sense. It's like, I'm looking at the environment, not to necessarily figure it out, I'm looking at the environment uh, in, amaze, in constant amazement. You know, so recently I just was in Tanzania with the scientists you know, scuba diving underwater. And you know, I was, it was a complete overload of like, it's my first time scuba diving, but it was an overload of just, I'm like, ah, the coral reefs are here. The coral, that coral reef, this shape, this fish, this thing, the weight of the water, I'm in sensory overload, you know? And I, I got out of the water for the first time and the scientist, a great friend of mine, he was like, you know, actually, you know, I could just, like when I'm doing my scientific research, you know, I'll just stay at this one rock for two hours and not even move. You know, I'll stare at that one rock and just look at the shape of that one rock, just connect to that one rock, you know? And I'm saying that because I felt like before I went scuba diving, that's how I looked at the environment. Like I can look at one leaf under the microscope for ages, you know, and just study this one leaf and see all the complexities in it. But when I was underwater, I totally forgot that. But I came back to it based on him reminding me after we got out. And I just want to reiterate that it's like my work is about obser observing the, the environment and like intensity, you know, looking at different scales, not just the scale that I can see, but also pinning myself or, or looking at the micro scale or the nano scale that I cannot see. Still in amazement, though. So not scientifically in the sense of trying to maybe figure it out or trying to, to even describe it in a way. It's more like I'm completely amazed. And the more I'm amazed by the environment, the more I actually want to connect to it in deeper ways, the more I respect the environment, the more I feel connected to it when I'm in that, that, that energy of amazement. And I stopped on this slide because I feel like not only, you know, I feel like because of the amazement, you know, um, many, I'm also amazed by different cultures all over the world. And I'm, I'm not saying, I mean, it's a tricky statement, but I'm not saying that I'm observing other cultural rituals or other cultural festivals or other cultures, the way that they connect to the environment in a scientific way, like analyzing. But I think that for me, it's very important to, to learn from, from different cultures. And also, it's very fascinating for me to, to understand basically different environmental uh, perspectives from, from different people. And I feel like that, by being open enough to understand, that then changes the weather and my mental ecology. So then I can, I can you know, then I, I move in the world a different way based on that. So I, I just wanted to, to stop, stop on that. Inspirations. Uh, Poetry, um, I'm very interested in poetry, this idea of poetic architecture, architecture that is not necessarily supposed to make you super comfortable and supposed to protect you from the outdoor environment. I'm very much so uh, uh, approach architecture from a, uh, you know, I like the idea of a bit of 
um, disturbance, as I, I said before, or sensory uh, perspectives that, that confront you in ways that you're not necessarily used to all of the, all of the time. So um, yes, yeah, just some random, random things I can read, material as world connector, um, perception, uh, I think uh, the, verti the vertical connection in my work and connecting to the cosmos or cosmological belief systems from other culture is really important. Learning through song and music uh, and stories, all are, are great insp inspirations. Um, yes, the feel. So on one side of this slide, this slide for me is architecture, is a form of architecture. You know, on this left side, you have the idea of becoming the feel. And on the right side, you have, let's say, things that I'm inspired by, but you have this, you know, just layerings of classifications and things that make up the feel. And I feel like this, this inner connectivity of how uh, the layerings of, of different systems or different ways of perceiving the world and, and all of my inspirations being layered like this, I, I term it the feel. Um, in, in my brain, I term it like these are, are my inspirations, but they make up um, a field in a way in my mental ecology that kind of under underlines a lot of what the studio work is about. So I'll just talk about one thing here, and that is the sacred. I feel like um, I've always questioned like what what makes something sacred. You know, like what, what, what makes something, you know, sacred? So for me, I haven't necessarily figured that out yet, um, what makes something sacred, but it's, it's a question that I, that I have in my practice a lot. I feel like all of the architectural works that um, I'm creating in the studio, I, I deem them as living architectural entities. They are alive, they are living not only through their material palette, but I feel like um, there's something uh, like an architectural presence or an energetic presence um, that can be evoked in these different spaces based on the performance, based on the, the different ceremonies and rituals that are, are done um, inside the temple. So I think the program makes the temple sacred, but then on the other hand, I also think that, like I said in the beginning, the transformation in the metamorphosis of death turning into life through the material chemistry that's embedded in the material of the of these temples or structures that I'm working on is also very much sacred um, in my opinion but my definition like I said is constantly evolving of what um, sacred sacred space is you know so I'm constantly experimenting with this in the work as well not imagination as a factor, not imagination as a factor, not imagination as a factor of the contracted reality in new ways, in new ways, in new ways, or the limits of the known compartments. What compartments? The known compartments. Not imagination and not known compartments, new ways, but to see as one does as one does energy and weakness. To see as one does as energy and weakness. As energy and weakness to see as one does. As one does energy and weakness, as one does water and rain, as one does mud and quicksand. That's, uh, it's really beautiful uh, to me, this poem. I think it's a, it's a poem that I've, that I've written, but also it's simply just about perception, you know, the way you see, do you really see the water and rain or do you just call rain, rain, you know? Do you see every, every droplet, you know, of water or is it rain? And it's about like the perception of classifying something with, with the word, but once you say it's a word, you know, you're not necessarily seeing it for exactly what it is, like the energy. If you say, okay, that's a mountain, but Okay, the mountain is the word of what it is, but what is it like really, you know, like really see. So, okay, so I'll talk about some projects now and, and 
shift the energy uh, of just different practicalities of different projects and the way the way I've been been working um, so did I get it right the first time material mineral and molecule okay so I'll start with this project this is a project um, that uh, it starts with the, the molecule we're gonna start with the molecule so this is a project where I was using um, the electron microscope to look at different contamination in the river Niger Delta of Nigeria. Um, there's a lot of, of oil spills that actually happen in, in this region and it affects the local community in, in, in different ways. Um, so I thought, you know, like how can I, like how can I really see, like I was just saying, how can I really see in a way, like what's happening on on a, a scale that I can't necessarily see with my eyes. So I thought, okay, let's see what's going on like underground in the soil. Let's see what's going on when all of that oil goes into the, the, the rivers. Let's see like the actual architectural chemistry of how these materials are mixing in da da da. As a as a, a poetic gesture, let's say as a thought provoker or a catalyst in a way. So a lot of times I work in this way of, of thought provoking or doing something that makes you maybe maybe it catches you because it's beautiful it's it looks beautiful but when you then dig deeper and figure out what it is it allows you to ask questions in a way so these are different samples at different scales on the electron microscope of different microorganisms being basically suffocated by the oil but also like different material palettes of the different minerals that's in the water that's in the oil and yeah, when I show these in different museums and different places, you know, people are, are saying, you know, hey, that's an amazing photograph, you know, da, 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 da. Of course they read the writing about it, but sometimes you have people that don't read the writing, you know, and they just say it's, it's beautiful. But then when I start to explain the story, it's just an extra layer of, of, of shock and in a way, not shock or just, it's just a, a uncomfortable um, dichotomy that happens in, in those moments. So this is another frame from, from that same collection. <clears throat> but I'm not always looking at the microscopic scale in a, a let's say in an angry way or in a way that's, that's really, uh, that is, is really trying to, 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 to say something to get you to look at it in the sense of seeing what's actually happening in a negative way. Sometimes I'm also just looking at uh, environmental elements that I pick up different samples or even, even constructing my own samples, my own landscapes in a way or natural elements under the microscope and then using those as architectural inspiration for different projects. So this is another one, uh, um, another scale from, from the Nigeria work. And going to what I just mentioned, I call this, this amazement that I have for the micro scale, I call it infinitesimal architecture. So architecture that is basically uh, very, very, very small, the architectural world for microorganisms. Um, I'm composing them on, on microscope slides as inspiration and as another way to connect to the environment in different ways. So I've done another collection um, of these, and that's using like mica, uh, silica, also mucus, blood, plasma, soil, uh, using different medicinal juices and herbs to basically make these landscapes. And then I, I photograph them under the microscope over time and watch how they decay and transform and, uh, and basically react. So yes, this is another another scale. Sometimes this is like using different uh, uh, indigo, but different hibiscus herbs and extracts mixed in with mica, silica, rainwater, soil water. And it's actually really quite vicious on this scale even. I mean, you'll see organisms eating each other and, uh, and like it's, it's really intense, um, intense uh, observation, I would say. So this is another palette. And interesting enough, I mean, these, the, these photographs in this collection, actually when I was flying in um, to Oregon, there were some 
really amazing uh, white and black mountain that I flew in over, you know? And I looked back at this collection and I was like, wow, it's so interesting how this can be two million times what my eye can see. But then when I look, you know what my eye can see is actually very similar aesthetically. Um, so for me, it's, it's that same philosophy as I am because you are or as above, so below. There's this constant reflection in geometry and uh, in, in just composition of the way the, the, micro, the macro world looks and also the, the micro world world. So this is that collection. I'll, I'll speed up a bit. So I'll go to the, the mineral. So as I mentioned before about ephemerality and entropy, like I'm also very interested in chemistry, like actually not just looking at matter, but also playing with it as an untrained chemist. So basically making a lot of experiments that fail most of the time. But through this interaction of like making experience and uh, making experiments, with different elements, different natural elements, I start to to learn, um, learn through through doing, and that's the artist in me. Learn through experiments, learn through making mistakes, um, and learn through through putting heat on on one of my samples and watching it crack or watching it melt or putting ice on it. So constantly like changing the environment in the studio space to have different effects, and so. Uh, the work I'll talk about now is called Cajola, and it's a, a series of, of footwear that I designed um, just using these different experiments with uh, different cellulose, um, different clays, but also uh, just a, a plethora of different uh, materials. I was mixing them to make these different types of skin. Um, and then after those skin, after, after I got the chemistry for the different skins down, I tried to then embed medicinal properties in, in each skin, but also just natural elements to get different thicknesses, get different weights, get different, uh, different properties. And because I was using cellulose, the actual material, I'll just go through some of the experiments uh, while I talk. The, because I'm using plant cellulose, it's basically a the, the, the fabric itself would, I mean, the, the skin itself would start to fold on, um, fold in on itself or try to curl back in a way like a plant. And so I'm sure you guys have seen different material experiments um, now using different materials or bioplastics and things like this. Um, but for me, the most interesting point for me was the fact that the material would roll back on itself to try and and like twist back based on the tension or whatever the additive that I added in the material. So I thought architecturally, okay, if something is twisting this way and then something, another one is twisting that way, maybe I can then layer them so then they cancel each other out in tension and kind of that, that, that force of, of wanting to roll this and wanting to roll that way would, would make it structurally stable. So then that's what I started to do. I started to make different experiments of, of, of these different materials. I started to, uh, to dye and put different, uh, different indigos, different um, lavenders, different, many different dyes inside the blueberry juice, many different sides, uh, many different uh, pigments inside the materials to see the effect, to see how that not change the color, but would change the curl for me. And so once I had an archive of these different materials, I started to, to think about how, just like my mental ecology connects me to the out, outward environment and I constantly have to, to feed that, I feel like the feet um, that touch the ground of the earth are really, really important elements on our body that stabilize us, but also in a way, like our eyes can see up here, but our feet are actually touching the ground. So this grounding element was very important for me. And plus, I just, I like footwear. Um, I like, I like footwear. So I just, I started to cut the, the pieces out in different forms, in different shapes. And then I was able to, to create a, a shoe out of the material. And so these are bases. These are like different soles that are made with different clays and stones and things like this. And this is like 
So then I started to sew these different pieces together with a Japanese uh, shoe patcher. And I got these, these shoes that, that are very much so alive and living. And uh, you can, based on the temperature, you can, they're all sewn together, but you can see them pulling and pu pulling each other apart, but then coming back together in a weird way. And then like they actually sweat, you know? So sometimes based on the, based on the temperature, you'll see it. It's like they're almost crying in a way or sweating. Water is accumulating on these shoes in the summer. And then in the winter, they're like cracking. So there's this constant uh, push pull, like reaction to the environment that the shoe is having. So the latest iteration of these now is I'm thinking, okay, if water actually comes out of the shoe on the material, then maybe there's a way to embed like medicinal herbs, like for it specifically for the feet inside the inner layer of the shoe. So then it can somehow sweat out into the skin of the, of the, of the, of the person that will wear it. But these are not wearable, you know, they're actually art objects. So as of right now, I'm still working with different collaborators um, on trying to somehow make it not necessarily commercial at all. I'm not interested in, in selling like uh, selling shoes really commercially in that way, but I would like to somehow figure out a way to transition this uh, these prototype designs into something that that can be worn uh, in different way and then just basically decay decay off your feet at some point and, and fall, fall, fall apart. Um, so hopefully at that stage, I'll put some seeds inside the fabric, so when they, inside the skin, so when they fall apart, they'll go straight to the, to the earth and grow. So I, uh, I think I'm, I'm running out of time a little bit. I have about 15 more minutes, but I'll try and run through two more quick projects. Um, so this idea of, of matter is what we'll talk about now. And I've always been inspired by species, like the variety of species that are all around, that are all around us. So butterflies, insects, frogs. I mean, I just think it's something really beautiful when you look at all of the diversity of form that is around us, like in all of these organisms. So I started to think about how I could, in a way, uh, commemorate some of the species that are no longer with us so endangered or even ex extinct, no longer with us, but endangered species also. How could I use my presence as an architect or an artist to somehow commemorate the species that are, are no longer with us? So I started to study different butterfly and moth species, and I started to translate their silhouettes and their patterns into fabrics. And these fabrics, I, some of them are hand painted, all of them are handmade, at this stage, but then they're also hand painted in inspiration for these these different species that are no longer with us. And this collection actually is about making different altars to not forget the the species that that were here before. So each fabric is uh, like I said, handmade, but I'm using different uh, natural materials like uh, cotton. I'm using um, wools, I'm using just different, a lot of different natural bamboo fiber, uh, camel wool, um, like the, the list goes on. There's, there's so many linen um, that I'm using to, to depict uh, these endangered species or species that are, are extinct. And the idea behind these, like I said, is the altar, but it's also to, to at some point actually like translate, the, because these are one-off ob art objects, but translate these forms into a system of production that can be, that the, the, the fabrics can be produced like for facades or for larger scale uh, structures, but also connect to that idea of like the facade should decay or be replaced or be transformed or should change color based on or, or change its, uh, not a structural quality, but basically it should change or react to the environment while it's, while it's on, on the facade. So that is kind of the, the next step. And to go into that, I'll talk about, so from this stage of like hand painting, being inspired by the, the, these different insects and organisms that are extinct, I then translate those into 
into basically these. And these are, are different prints that I then replicate on a larger scale to make, let's say, facades or different pavilions. But each one is still inspired by, uh, inspired by those organisms that are extinct or endangered. So then you have these patterns and or these arrangements and these, these patterns that then can be stretched to the wall. And one thing that is always a surprise for me is that when I actually connect all of these organisms together in a way, it makes a larger organism or let's say an ecosystem. But the beautiful part to me is that the collaboration that these fabrics as facades or temple, temple material, the collaboration that they have with the sunlight to then get new shadows I feel like it's always a surprise for me, but it's actually really, really amazing when people walk through uh, the different temples and pavilions and the shadows like drip, drip on them. I feel like at that point, going back to my, my first question or my first, uh, my, my first question of what is sacred, I like the idea of when that collaboration happens in the temple with the unexpected <sighs> shadows coming in, there's something really sacred uh, uh, about that that I, I enjoy quite, quite a bit. So now I'll talk about very quickly uh, kind of the buildup of what I've been talking about the whole, the whole talk is this idea of ephemerality, but also um, the sacredness of a temple, but also the material, the, the, the molecular, all of it kind of comp. Uh, all of it kind of comes together uh, in these projects. So this is so, so, uh, No No Soil Temple, and this was in Paris at the Palais de Tokyo Museum for their um, Reclaim the Earth exhibition. And basically, I was walking, I live half the year in London, half the year in the Amazon forest, and based on a walk I had, I was just thinking like, what would it feel like to be completely surrounded by soil, like in an architectural structure, but just floating soil, not soil like a, a clay wall or something, just floating like, like soil. And what would, what would it feel like if you could smell that soil or you could touch that soil or even be buried in that soil in a way, in a public environment and, and somewhere where people could completely use this space as like a sacred, uh, a sacred object to connect with soil in, a, in the bustling city of, of Paris. So, so No No Soil Temple has this, basically this bed of soil that's inside and we actually, this was a collaboration with Amakaba organization, uh, a healing center based in the Amazon forest where, uh, where basically people were buried inside of the temple. They would come in and basically asked if they could be buried and there was a performance that people were just completely surrounded, uh, surrounded by the soil. There was also a sound piece connected to this that encompassed people and engulfed people inside of the pavilion as they, uh, inside the temple as they would come inside. But what really, what really inspires me about this project is I think it's beautiful to have the work in museums. I think it's great, you know, that people can connect with the work in one way, but like I said in the beginning, like my work is about decay and ephemerality. So after this piece is installed in a museum, it goes back to the Amazon forest and literally becomes, in, it literally it's being installed now in the forest. So basically plants can grow over it, completely take it over. Snakes will be living inside, birds will be living inside and it will completely engulf uh, this, 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 uh, this temple. So it won't look like this in, in five years, it'll either be all green or all, I don't know, white, brown, I'm not sure. But this element of the unpredictable that happens um, to the temple when it's in a certain environment for a long period of time is what really, really uh, connects me and, and inspires me uh, in this work. So this is one of the burials uh, inside. You can see different people uh, participating in the burial, listening to the sound. So I'll quickly breeze through this project. It's really, really quick, and uh, I'm actually leaving to the Netherlands to install it now. But this is P2 Fertilization Temple, 
and it really connects to the same type of uh, ideologies as, as the first project. I won't talk about it so much because, because of time. Um, just very quickly, this is another temple. This temple was really about smell. So it's the same, um, it's the same composition of materials using fabrics and things like this to, to connect people to, in this case, medicinal plants. So I had the privilege at, I'm teaching at, at Columbia in the summers. So I had the privilege of like really looking at the back of a, a fire ant looking at the back of its neck and using that in the form as the inspiration. So again, it connects this micro to the macro. So then after getting this form, we then start to think about what kind of plants that were aromic, but also could connect to like womb health and like fertility um, and, and, and just different uh, medicinal plants that, that help um, through birth um, or with birth. Um, that was my collaborator's main interest was like womb health for women and mine was more of the aromic um, the aromic healing powers of plants so again more symbolism with uh, the form and the structure of how it connects to both the ants um, nervous system but also different medicinal plants and flowers and so here you have Aikum this was the final piece of it so you basically walk through and all of these bouquets are medicinal plants at the end of the exhibition, people were invited to take the plants home and uh, basically boil them and use them. But all of the plants came in fresh. And then over time, uh, the plants will constantly release its smell, dry out and become medicinal. But the smell for me, the unseen smell and that constant change is what was really beautiful because throughout the duration of six months of the show, it will be constantly transforming and evolving. So very quickly, these are some, some images of the roof structure and of these plant pockets. And then uh, to, to finish, I think this is, a, this is in the Amazon forest, but this is just one altar um, of a skin and then it transforms um, with plants. And then from plants, it transforms again over this, I think this is about seven months in the forest. It's completely engulfed. So No No and Aikum and all of them at some point will completely look like this. And the fabrics become like this back layer skin that completely connects back to the, the ephemeral. And yes, I really, I really love this image. It's super beautiful. Yes, and I'm finished. Thank you so much. That's the QR code. I if you have any questions for Yusuf, Yusuf, sorry, Yusuf, uh, go ahead and scan this QR code, and um, we'll be collecting them in a Google Sheet. Um, and or if you have trouble accessing that, we can also take questions from the crowd. And I'll pass it off to Ankita. Thank you, thank you, Yusuf, for sharing your work with us. Is there any questions from the crowd? Okay, sure. Cheers. Thank you so much. I think smell for me is really important because I think it's the most uh, enigmatic, is that the word I wanna say? A most mysterious sense that we have. I feel like, I mean, there's certain audio tones that kind of, you know, you know, you can hear up to this point, you can, you can not hear up to that point, or there's certain uh, rays of light that we can see. We know we can't see past this, past this, but smell is like you can never, uh, quantify how much and how many smells you you can remember even 
in a way. And I feel like this is, is quite, uh, it's really interesting for me. And I think smell also is, is a, it's a highly medicinal, I mean, it's a, a medicinal sense that, that, that we have here, you know? Um, so yes, I, I feel like also, I think just from being in the forest, the Amazon so much, I feel that, you know, there's this quote, like the animals see or smell you way before you see them, you know? So I feel like even just being very precautious, you know, when I walk through the forest in certain places, it's like I can smell like when an organism is dying, like over there, or I can smell something here and here. It like, for me, after being in the forest for, for a bit of time, I really like just saw how my nose changed in a way and so I really wanted to kind of mimic that in a, an environment like a museum or a different place um, like this. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the crowd? Oh, we have a question for you. Uh, what's your next big project? Uh, oof, so after I leave here I, I go to the Netherlands uh, for P2 Fertilization Temple, that's at Van Ab Museum. And then May, I'm in Venice at the, I'm representing the British Pavilion at the Architectural Biennial. And then Sharjah is in November and other, other projects too. Um, yes. How exciting. Yeah, there's a question from the crowd. Hi Yusuf, thank you so much for this presentation and your time. <coughs> um, I think one of the questions I had was, have you ever experimented with uh, incorporating catalysts into like degeneration so that like you can mimic almost what industry does on the human scale to us and then taking that into like your work of like, you know, different sort of catalysts, how they degenerate these like materials? Okay, explain a little more what you mean by catalyst. I mean, catalyst as starting something. You know, but yeah. explain exactly in specifics what you mean. Yeah, so I think by catalyst, the way I'm looking at it as almost these systems, like man-made systems that are, I guess, accelerating uh, really natural processes. Um, so I think that's the perspective I'm coming from. Okay. Yes, for me, everything is about slowing down in a way. I really like to go slow, you know? And so for me, even with the observation, I feel like, like even with the footwear, like I don't want to mass produce it. Like I don't want it to really be something that is super accessible in this way. I kind of like the idea of um, experience something once or twice with a lot of intensity, you know, and, and not necessarily like experience it a lot of times with less intensity. So like for me, I think going slow, slowing down and like, you know, really contemplating like contemplation spaces and projects that make us think the poetry in it is really important for me thank you so much did it answer your question or did i no no that, that, that resonates in a way okay 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 yeah. are there any more questions yeah. okay we have one in the crowd let's take that Thank you so much for being here. Um, this was an incredible, an incredible talk, and I love your work. Um, you talk about contemplative architecture, and there is such a pressure in in school, but also in the practice, um, at least in the states, about time and your tone turnover rate. You know, and how quickly you can produce a project. And um, I think, what would your advice be for incorporating some of how you think about architecture and creation into um, for for those starting out. Yeah, that's a really great question, and I'm glad that you asked it in a way because I think I mean I trained as an artist first, you know, and then as an architect. So I've kind of found my space within biennales, museums, and like I mentioned in the beginning, like the let's say the the class of architecture that's interested in like those cultural spaces or buildings or large scale things, I can understand the demands, but I would say you gotta find your own voice. 
you know, within within architecture. I don't think architecture is limited to only one type of tectonic and one type of uh, expression, which is even the, the built form. I feel like you can negate the built form and work on something totally different. For me, architecture, I think I've been, I guess, blessed to have great, great architectural uh, teachers or I guess mentors in a way, but I feel like um, architecture in a sense is, it's uh, the best thing you get out of architecture school is a skill set of thinking critically, I mean, critically, you know? But you can apply that to so many different things in a way, depending on, on what you want to do. So I would say, under, like, use your architectural, the pedagogy, use your architectural education um, to do what you want, find your voice, but also know that you can apply it to many different other things, you know? You don't have to necessarily go the path of, you know, just producing like certain buildings and certain da da da. You can find your voice. That's my, that's my opinion. Um, yeah, we got one more question. Could you talk about the role of legibility in your work? Is it's interesting that some of the works, such as footwear, are recognizable as such, and there there's a certain uncanniness to it. Legibility? Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I mean, for me, my interest in the, in the, in the, I hope the work is, is, is some, somehow too, uh, you know, not legible in the sense that, you know, I think it's, it's nice when you have to try and figure something out. You know, so the footwear as a form, I guess we can recognize and we know it's legible, but actual, actually the material uh, palette and the, the, the chemistry of each and every material, I might not even know, you know? I, I mean, I've done so many experiments now that I might not even know, but for me, the legibility or, or being able to understand what you're seeing for me is always an amazement when it reacts to the environment. So again, it's like, if I don't know what's actually there, I'm always amazed by how it transforms in a way. So this is important. Okay. Thank Cheers. you, Yusuf. And just real quick, one last question is, how can uh, people here connect with you further? Uh, Come talk to you my, afterwards? Yes, my, <laughs> yes, my email or something like this. My, uh, yeah, Oleni Studio is, is online. You guys can check out work there. And I hope to update uh, the site soon with newer projects um, and things like this. So thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you, Yusuf. Cheers.